Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, it's fabulous to see so many people here. My name is Professor Jenny Lydalis. Um, I'm the Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business and Law, and until last week, I was the Dean of the Law School. Um, welcome, everyone, to tonight's Law Oration, which is titled, Using the Law to Change Society, Sport, Human Rights and National Identity, which we are incredibly delighted to announce will be presented by Craig Foster AM. And to this evening, I'd like to welcome Craig, as well as members of the Deakin um, Council and Executive, members of the Deakin Law School Advisory Board, Deakin donors, Deakin alumni, Deakin staff, stu particularly the Deakin Law staff, of course, students and friends of Deakin. But before we start this evening's proceedings, I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we stay tonight, um, and we repay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. But in addition to my, my acknowledgement of country, I'd like to warmly welcome Marandindi, who is head man of the Wurundjeri people, for a particular welcome to country. Thank you, Marandindi. Thank you, thank you. In my language, we say, Wumunjika Naganga Kundua. Wumunjika mean welcome on the land of my ancestors. Now, this is my country, this is my land. Not only my country, my land, this is your land. You've made your home here on Wurundjeri country. So you are all welcome on our land. But the most important thing, we show respect to one another. We show respect the way you want to be respected. Now, I started only 38 years ago. 38 years ago, my calling was from the spirit. I saw my great, great, great grandfather. He sat on my bed and it turned my whole life around. My wife said to me, you must go and teach your culture, you must teach your history. And 38 years, I listened to my wife, the last 38 years. And here I am today, didn't go to school, couldn't read, couldn't write, till the age of 38. And here I am today teaching my culture, my history. I was very lucky that I was brought up with my culture and brought up with my history. Here I am teaching it in schools today and functions like this. But the most important thing, we must learn to love and respect one another for who they are. It doesn't matter where we come from in this world, we're all sisters and brothers and we must learn to come together in harmony and peace and respect one another. Now this song 
that I'm going to sing for you. There's only two of us today who can sing this song in the Wurundjeri language. That's myself and my younger brother. And uh, I always think I'm a better singer than what he is. He's not bad, but he'll never catch me. So this is a song in my language, what has been passed down by the elders. Woman Jika, welcome on the land of the Wurundjeri people. And don't forget, this is your country too. We all live here together in peace and harmony and respect one another. Thank you. Marandini, thank you for your very gracious uh, welcome to country and your comments. Um, and now on behalf of the Acting Dean of the Law School, Professor Marilyn McMahon and myself, I'd like to welcome to the stage um, our Chancellor, John Stanhope AM. Thank you, Jenny, and uh, thank you, Murundindi. Um, and I pay my respects to you and to the Wurundjeri people and acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to all elders, past, present and emerging. And thank you so much for that warm welcome to country. I also acknowledge here uh, Craig Foster, our AM, our speaker tonight. I'm sure we're all anxious to hear what he has to say, say to us. And of course, I acknowledge Professor Jenny Live Alice, who is in several roles, <laughs> Dean of Law, but Acting Executive Dean of Business and Law at the moment. And all the members of Deakin Council that are here, the Executive who are here, the Deakin Law School Advisory, and many key contributors to the school, and Deakin Create. Good evening to you all and welcome. Today is the first day of the Victoria Law Foundation's Law Week 2023. And Deakin through our law school is proud to support and be part of it. Across Victoria, events will be running such as this, designed to help Victorians learn more about the law and its history in our country and understand their rights, find answers to their questions, and know what is available and how our legal system works. Tonight's event is another occasion to celebrate our continued learning and community engagement. I would now like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Craig Foster AM. Following a decorated football career as Australia's 419th Socceroo and 40th captain, Craig has become one of Australia's most respected sports people as a broadcaster, social justice advocate and human rights campaigner. Following a retirement from his playing days, he quickly became one of Australia's most respected sports broadcasters and had an 18-year career with our multicultural broadcaster, SBS. A career that has seen him win three Logies. Craig's passionate commentary for the 2005 World Cup qualification playoff match against Uruguay at Australia Stadium, Sydney, stands as one of the sport's most iconic broadcast moments. Today, Craig covers the UEFA Champions League for Stan Sport. Australia. Beyond the sporting field and commentary box, Craig is a member of the Australian Multicultural Council under the Department of, of Home Affairs, Immigration and Citizenship Division. 
who works across a vast range of social programs from Indigenous rights and self-determination, homelessness and domestic violence, climate action and gender equality, and is particularly well known for his refugee advocacy. This advocacy includes his recent work with Deakin Create, our Centre for Refugee Employment Ad Advocacy Training and Education. His human humanitarian activism extends to several high profile campaigns and he is the co-author of several books including Fighting for Hakim by Hashid Australia and he writes for The Guardian and The Age. In 2019, the Australian Financial Review re recognised Craig as a true Australian leader. The Sydney Morning Herald described him as one of the people that defined 2019. He was the recipient of the 2020 New South Wales Government Humanitarian Award for his work with sport and human rights. And in 2023, Craig was awarded the New South Wales Australian of the year. There is so much more to this multi-dimensional inspiring Australian. But like me, I'm sure you'd rather hear him speak and absorb some of his wisdom. His topic, as Jenny said, is using the law to change society, sport, human rights and national identity. The advent of international human rights law in sport has challenged the prevailing paradigms, forced sport to reckon with its supposed apolitical nature and highlighted harms previously ignored. Using the rights of affected people, Craig will discuss the path Australia is walking towards a truly inclusive identity. Please welcome to the stage, Craig Foster. All right, thank you very much, Chancellor. And uh, you referenced the, what you called famous 2005 match where the soccer is qualified for the FIFA World Cup after 32 years. How many people in the room were aware of that game? A lot, you were at it. Uh, it's true uh, that we won a Logie for that game and for others, but you know what? Uh, it was really quite simple. Uh, at the end of the game, when the goal went in, all I did was scream for about 60 seconds long. <laughs> so I, I feel as though I uh, reduced the profession to its nucleus. And in the end, uh, we were very successful. I want to thank you for the invitation to speak this evening. It's a really important opportunity uh, on what, for me, is a, a cause very close to my heart. I want to thank Maran Dindi for that marvellous uh, welcome to country and uh, add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people, and would like to formally acknowledge that the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the first important step of the Voice to Parliament referendum later this year is the manifestation in the Australian context of the right of Indigenous peoples everywhere to self-determination. The power that you, many in this room, students, of Deakin and the law fraternity hold by virtue of your ability to manipulate, change, reshape and challenge laws is vast and has a direct impact on human endeavour, certainly on freedoms about which conversations exploded during the social and political response to COVID-19, on whether people are incarcerated or otherwise, which directly impacts tens of thousands of refugees and their families in Australia and still offshore, on journalistic freedom, the rights of whistleblowers like Julian Assange, Witness K, or indeed Bernard Colliery, and whether our basic rights are provided or taken. Your work fundamentally protects, challenges, or changes the way that Australians and others around the world can live their lives. 
It's so important, and I've seen firsthand many examples of the power that you hold of legal practitioners to change the lives of the innocent, the disadvantaged, the victimised, and those left behind or left out of the benefits that most of us take for granted by being part of this society. Let's explore some of those today to both acknowledge the work that you do and perhaps encourage you to create more positive change. It's critically important. In the next short while, we'll touch on the power of human rights law in sport, refugee rights in international and domestic law, First Nations rights to self-determination, and finish with a call to action for constitutional reform to reflect Australia's contemporary value set. It's difficult to imagine that is over four years ago when a young Bahraini refugee provided protection by Australia was arrested when landing at Bangkok Airport on his honeymoon by virtue of an Interpol red notice which contemplated his extradition back to Bahrain. It seems like yesterday, having lived through that 77 days many, many times hence. Nevertheless, the ultimate success of a global campaign from human rights bodies, current and former athletes across a range of sports, and eventually the Australian government and prime minister of the day was very much grounded in international human rights law. And particularly the fact that global football through its governing body, Federation Internationale de Football Association, more commonly known as FIFA, had instituted the first human rights policy at statutory level of any major global sport. It was this framework that enabled us to advocate so strongly and to call for action by all stakeholders within the sport for Hakeem al Arabi, rather than merely appeal to their better nature or somehow try to find a point of leverage that would free this innocent young man. Returning briefly back to the 2010 decisions for Russia and Qatar to host the 2018 and 2022 World Cups, those decisions so sparked reprisals and concerns about the human rights impacts of the tournaments, including then anti-gay laws in Russia and migrant worker exploitation in particular in Qatar, along with the criminalization of the LGBTI community and lack of press freedoms, that FIFA was placed under immense pressure to mitigate these adverse impacts ahead of the events. It was also important that FIFA had made the decisions in 2010 with a full eight and 12 years respectively until the events, allowing ample time for research, organisation and advocacy to take place on an industrial and global scale by the human rights community. Thus, in 2017, in response to the report into FIFA's human rights obligations as an organisation and that of its member bodies, including Football Australia, by Professor John Ruggie of Harvard University, for the game, for the world, in 2016, architect of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, known as the UNGPs, FIFA's human rights policy was adopted. This obligated FIFA itself and the major sporting events for which they are responsible to be audited, for FIFA to create an independent human rights advisory board to provide an independent adversarial and monitoring process, and ensure the organisation could be held accountable by the major human rights organisations globally, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, along with athlete and other labour rights organisations. It also led to the creation of several important advocacy groups, the Sport and Rights Alliance, built by athlete and broader unions, and the Centre for Sport and Rights in Geneva. Hakim's timing was then, 
in one way, advantageous. Because these groups were now in place, flexing their capabilities, creating alliances and networks with governments and non-governmental bodies that would be critically important in applying pressure for action by FIFA and governments around the world. The human rights policy that obligated FIFA to uphold all internationally recognised human rights, including all those contained in the International Bill of Rights, which include the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and the International Labour Organization's Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. Crucially, it also included the Convention Relating to the Status of Refugees, the Refugee Convention of 1951, which allowed us to reference Hakim's status, his protection against reformon or extradition back to Bahrain, and crucially, for the first time globally, the obligation that FIFA had a direct duty to protect him. And under their policy, as importantly, used their leverage with governments to advocate for his protection. Article 4 of FIFA's policy states, FIFA will strive to go beyond its responsibility to respect human rights, as enshrined in the UNGPs, by taking measures to promote the protection of human rights and positively contribute to their enjoyment, especially where it is able to apply effective leverage to help increase said enjoyment, or where this relates to strengthening human rights in or through football. Given that the Vice President of FIFA was a member and is a member of the Bahraini royal family, this leverage was immense. However, prevent, presented serious internal political barriers that would need to be challenged. Thankfully for Hakim, challenging injustice is something that Australians do quite well. You might even say, we relish the opportunity. What is most interesting is that the human rights policy meant that FIFA, the world's largest sporting body with over 250 million participants and the largest reach of any major sporting events on earth were directly bound to stand for the rights of a refugee simply because he played the game. That is the power of human rights when embedded within sport. One of the world's most socially and culturally influential institutions and industries. The fact that a member of the Bahraini royal family who had been president of the Bahrain Football Association when Hakim, the national team captain, and over 150 other athletes were rounded up following the peaceful pro-democracy demonstrations of the Arab Spring, was now president of the Asian Football Confederation and vice president of FIFA, and was therefore at the very heart of the organisation tasked with a timely and robust response, would ordinarily have meant that global football simply would not move for this young man. The political and economic constraints were just far, far too great. The life of one young, unheralded and unknown player from a small golf country and a professional, semi-professional club in Melbourne by the name of Pasco Vale could not possibly be of con consequence to an organisation that is deeply political, worth billions, nor a governing body that represented the riches, royal families and connections of the Gulf region one of which desperately wanted this young man back. Very, very badly. Hakim Al-Arabi owes his life 
not just to an international coalition of individuals, organisations and high profile athletes that put enough pressure on Thailand, Bahrain and Australia to free him from prison and almost certain death. He owes his life to a human rights policy. His rights didn't change throughout the 77 days. They did not suddenly evaporate nor strengthen. And nor could they be called into question. They were and are universal, objective, and agreed by the majority of nations. But this is true of all asylum seekers and refugees. And look how that has gone for those seeking safety in Australia. Decades lost, lives destroyed, and a nation that lost its own sense of right and wrong, only now rediscovering and recovering our sense of basic humanity when it comes to vulnerable people seeking safety, and still with a very long path to climb. This potential for sport to create important social change based on international human rights law and objective standards of human treatment cannot be overstated and was further in evidence again late last year prior to and during the FIFA male World Cup in Qatar. In past decades, by way of contrast, the dislocation of impoverished from the streets in the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Games, in the extraordinary Clean the Streets campaign, and poor and indigenous people from Brazilian favelas in Rio for the 2014 FIFA World Cup and 2016 Rio Olympics, for example, was almost entirely a matter for local advocacy groups as the global sporting bodies transferred responsibility to domestic tournament organisers. It's not our business, the AOC and FIFA would say. It's not our business. However, today, given their adopted obligations, responsibility rightly lies with the parent body that controls the rights and which makes the decision as to host country and on what conditions these sporting mega events will take place. This framework led directly to vociferous calls for migrant worker rights in the face of very significant abusive practices, including working conditions in contravention of fundamental international labour standards, wage theft, and the abusive kafala system of labour enslavement that led to many thousands of deaths in developing the infrastructure for the event. Some figures go as high as around 6,500 who perished building the 220 billion US dollars of infrastructure for the event, though a lack of official records mean that we will likely never know. But for the first time in many decades, and in a simply astounding set of circumstances in which Qatar found itself under siege from football players, fans, and advocacy groups over more than a decade, the International Labour Organization, ILO, was able to form agreements with the Qatari government. The kafala system was fundamentally overhauled and Qatar forced to implement progressive steps towards basic rights for workers. The effect of this is profound. The political, economic and social influence of sport, when brought together with universal human rights principles, saw major improvements in the daily lives and conditions of literally millions of workers. The reforms didn't go far enough. And this was the first substantive test case of a global sports commitment to upholding its pledges 
that was found badly wanting. But it was sport that ensured they were implemented at all. As a supporter of a campaign by Amnesty International and others for FIFA to provide compensation for all the families of deceased workers called Pay Up FIFA, in which those families would receive the same amount as the prize money paid to players for the event, around 440 US million dollars, which seemed a minimum requirement. I spoke to many labour rights groups all across Asia, advocates for basic protections for vulnerable and highly exploited migrant workers. They told me they'd been working for decades in an attempt to convince the Qatari government to come into line with international standards to no avail. Nothing had moved the Qataris to action. Not international pressure, not, not multilateral delegations, not media condemnation. But because of the FIFA World Cup, and only because of it, they now saw the first positive change in their lifetimes. Sport loves to preach about being and doing good in the world. And here, through a human rights commitment, it had been proven so. While the criminalization of the LGBTI community in Qatar was an issue that was also prosecuted publicly by advocacy organizations, other than Australia's male national team, the Socceroos, who released a powerful statement and associated video calling for the decriminalization of the community in Qatar, most players and FIFA were not committed to upholding fundamental rights in the same way. Nevertheless, Qatar was a test case for athlete advocacy and governing body obligations in the future. If sport is willing to use its power to the benefit of vulnerable people everywhere, what more can it do through a human rights lens? It's worthwhile, therefore, bringing the conversation home to Australia and to ask, how might this movement for sport to uphold human rights benefit the millions of Australians who participate and broader society itself? Perhaps the most visible example is in advancing the fight against racism and the rights to non-discrimination and against racial vilification of all Australians. And the Australian Football League, the AFL, has been at the centre of the issue on many occasions, as has Rugby League and my own game of football. Recently, in fact, we saw the great Nicky Winmar and legendary First Nations athlete Nova Paris OAM call for life bans by the AFL for racial vilification a full 30 years after Winmar's now famous lifting of his shirt on the playing field to show the colour of his skin. 30 years. Look, he was saying, this is who I am, a proud black man. Courage personified. For there are costs for a First Nations person to be so courageous in Australia in 2023. But few could have thought we would be little nearer a robust, practical and effective response across all of Australian sport all of three decades later. Sport cannot possibly be proud of our response to racism. Presently, we see two principal situations. Either another player racially vilified at their workplace, the stadium, or increasingly historic allegations coming to light. Overall, we might agree that Australian sport has struggled to manage the issue 
to ensure either protection for its athletes when competing or adequate amelioration of historical issues raised. Were Australian sport to adopt a human rights framework, however, the entire approach would be very different. And I would argue far more effective, proactive and exemplary to broader Australia. And that is in part what sport exists for. To provide a visible model of how to confront important social issues that exist everywhere and rarely more visibly than on the sports field. Under the guiding principles on business and human rights, which underpinned the FIFA policy, Australian sport would have an obligation to follow the respect, protect, remedy process and to audit their human rights risks, including historical issues in something of a truth-telling process to ensure that protections and systems are in place to manage these risks and that victim-centred structures are available to properly provide remedy for affected parties. For victims of racism. Victims. For that's what they are. In a time of growing ideological extremism, of, according to the Australian Security and Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, which is having to continually increase its focus on racial hate and extreme forms of discrimination. How powerful would such a response by all of Australian sport collectively be to the broader community? What phenomenal leadership for Australian sport to say, we are going to the very heart of the matter and opening the pages of our own history to encourage victims to come forward so that we can create safe spaces for every Australian to participate. But moreover, to demonstrate to all Australians the gravity with which we consider this behaviour. Professor Ruggie talked about the journey from constitution to culture, from reactive to proactive, and from insular to accountable. Few would argue that Australian sport is immune to this same journey. And the entire approach could and would change overnight. We would see sport having to ensure that former athletes and employees of clubs, federations and other administrative bodies have an opportunity to report on racism faced in the past. For these to be dealt with rather than a process that currently too often positions brand and reputation as a core determinant. And on ensuring that athletes have a safe working environment consistent with their basic rights not to be discriminated against. My game of football would benefit from this. As we've seen very recently at both professional and semi-professional level, a number of extremely worrying incidents relating to anti-Semitism, reflecting the rise of neo-Nazism in Australia and racism against First Nations players and participants. Presently, we are still responding ineffectively, I would say, to incidents with club fines and individual sanctions, rather than auditing the entire game from top to bottom and asking what infrastructure is required to create safety? And what does remedy look like for the affected parties? This would be a very welcome positive adjustment for sport and I would strongly argue a step forward in the proper maximisation and utilisation of the social licence of sport to help under, uh, Australia understand the gravity of racism and to finally confront it would take us far beyond anti-racism campaigns and club-centred reports to ensure the entire industry 
puts an environment free of racism at the top of its agenda. If sport does this, how great is the broader influence on Australian society, I ask you. Moving now to the voices of well-known and respected athletes, we also find the influence of human rights law in amplifying issues in a way that maintains a neutrality from partisan politics, something that sport always struggles to clearly articulate, and provides a framework for effective advocacy, although athletes are not always aware of the symmetry. Several years ago, I wrote an online course for sport practitioners, whether administrator, fan or athlete, to understand international human rights law, its applicability to sport, and to provide tools for athletes to advocate safely and effectively for human rights through the platform they've developed by virtue of their sporting ex excellence, sacrifice and determination. Australian cricket captain Pat Cummins is a strong advocate for clean energy and action on climate degradation. Recently recognised by the United Nations as the human right to a healthy environment. Well done to Pat. Seven time Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton wears a rainbow helmet for races in the Middle East where the LGBTI community is still criminalised thereby challenging orthodoxy, providing visibility to a demonised community and amplifying an important issue around the world. And even the famous moment when Cathy Freeman carried the Aboriginal flag at the 1994 Commonwealth Games following her competitive success is simply a demonstration of her and her community's fundamental right to self-determination and expression of culture. If it was seen as such at the time, we could have avoided a mountain of column inches, racism and vilification for a legendary athlete standing up for the very basic rights of First Nations Australians. Cathy's career was almost brought to an end because of her simple, courageous and justified action Thankfully, today the conversation has shifted and the athlete voice is finding new resonance. Sport, however, is struggling to come to terms with this development as it attempts to restrict the right of athletes to free speech within the athletic environment, offering preferring to characterise human rights advocacy as political, usually because it offends a corporate sponsor or host nation which is breaching the very rights that sport purports to promote. The recent proposed Visit Saudi sponsorship of the Women's FIFA World Cup in Australia is a prominent and very recent example. In this case, FIFA had the primary obligation to advocate for these rights. However, successfully limited the athlete voice in the case of Qatar, disallowing the wearing of rainbow armbands, for example, by captains, while losing the battle in the case of the Saudi Tourism Authority. In any event, although we can't fully quantify the social value of these conversations occurring through sport, they are certainly capable of producing great change. Sport has always provided visibility for issues that are otherwise unspoken. Let's turn now to First Nations rights in Australia. Every legal mind in the room, and there are many, is acutely aware of the Uluru Statement and Voice to Parliament referendum later in the year, because it is through legal mechanisms that 253 years of pain and suffering may finally be confronted I hope so, at least. Last week, we saw that the National Rugby League, the NRL, came out in strong support of the proposed constitutional changes to provide representation on behalf of First Nations peoples to Parliament and the Executive Government on matters that relate to them. 
I would say that all of sport, like any other institution in the country, has a duty to uphold basic human rights and therefore must support First Nations' right to self-determination. And as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 2007, succinctly states in Articles 3, 4 and 5, Indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. Indigenous peoples, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social and cultural institutions while retaining their rights to participate fully if they so choose in the political, economic, social and cultural life of the state. Therefore, the intersection of sport and international human rights law dictates that all of sport is in support. And yet, as yet, our major sports of AFL, football and cricket are in the process of formulating their approach. You might have heard very predictable calls for sport to stay out of politics in response to the NRL statement. I love that one. It usually comes from those who are often the greatest transgressors in using sport for their political ends when it suits them, which is very often. As someone pointed out last week, government commentators and politicians love to attend professional sports ANZAC rounds, where Defence Force personnel stand to attention and the last post is proudly and meaningfully played. Sport is an important social institution that cannot escape its obligations to broader society. Nonetheless, few things are more political than using sport to celebrate or mark moments of national significance. And the commemoration of some historical moments is by definition the absence of elevation of others, such as the frontier wars, for example. These choices are inherently political and rarely discussed. The playing of the national anthem is also in and of itself a deeply political act at a national sporting contest. As is the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison inviting himself into rugby league dressing rooms. Or even Bob Hawke trying unsuccessfully to defend a bouncer during the annual Prime Minister's 11 cricket match. Why use sport after all to bridge the divide between a Prime Minister and the Australian Press Gallery. An Olympic Games is as much a political tool as a sporting event. And Australia's global diplomacy and international image will certainly be a beneficiary of the forthcoming FIFA Women's World Cup beginning on July 20 here in Australia and co-hosted by New Zealand. One at which I'm deeply hopeful that the Matildas will win. And finally, this evening, let us finish on another constitutional issue that goes to the nature of Australia. Who we are, who we wish to be, and what we stand for. Last weekend, we saw the crowning of Australia's King, Charles III who called for all Australians as one of his remaining 14 realms, for which he remains head of state, to call out our loyalty and allegiance to him, his heirs and successors. Now, in the absence of empirical data as to how many Australians took the pledge, <laughs> we, can, we can pretty safely assume it wasn't many given the muted response to the coronation, including from states and territories and premiers, 
and even high-profile Australian singers who declined to be involved due to the momentum for Australia's own head of state. I did walk outside in Sydney and listen at around that precise moment. And if there were joyous cries of allegiance, they just didn't carry as far as one would expect in the clear autumn air. As co-chair of the Australian Republic movement, along with the brilliant Nova Paris, I'm clearly in favour of constitutional change to remove the formal connection between the British monarchy and Australia and Austra uh, ensure that Australians finally inherit our own country. But perhaps we might return to First Nations rights to capture the importance of international law and historical justice in this long-awaited step to full independence. Last year in September, last year, the United Nations Human Rights Council conducted an interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to consider the ongoing legacies of colonisation and racism on Indigenous peoples globally. I'm going to say that again. Last year in September, the United Nations Human Rights Council conducted a dialogue with a Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to consider the ongoing legacies of colonisation and racism on Indigenous peoples globally. Then Acting Human Rights Commissioner Nada al Nashif concluded that addressing the negative impacts of the legacies of colonialism on human rights enjoyment today can contribute to overcoming inequalities within and among states and sustainable development challenges of the 21st century. In what was a profoundly important discussion, it was recognised that colonialism had led to racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance as recognised by states through the Durban Declaration and Programme of Action in 2001 at the World Conference Against Racism, the WCAR. Farine Shepherd, chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, stated that it was time for former colonial powers to face up to the wrongs of the past and engage in conversation with former colonies. Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination and Related Intolerance, E. Tendai Achiumi was right, in my view, in saying that some of the most entrenched forms of systemic racism were the result of continuing legacies of slavery and colonialism. And Fabian Salvioli, Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Truth, Justice, Reparation and Guarantees of Non-Repetition, said, the colonial transfer of wealth and racist oppression had created a legacy of social, economic and cultural exclusion whose effects had been felt for generations. These conversations have accelerated at global level. And last week, First Nations and Indigenous peoples of 12 nations with Charles as head of state, including Australia, called for formal apology, reparations, and the repatriation of artefacts and remains, of which 32,000 remain in UK museums, property of First Nations peoples, and of you and I, of Australia. These are fundamentally important discussions which go to the nature of Australia's commitment to justice, a core pillar of any nation state committed to the enjoyment of human rights by all of its people. By all of its people. Australia is walking a path of truth-telling and reparatory justice with First Nations, which is what the Uluru Statement from the Heart is all about. And it's time for all Australians to call on the Crown, on Charles, to join this conversation and be accountable as a core contributor to the ongoing disadvantage that First Nations experience today. Not only constitutional law, but therefore international human rights law is at the very centre 
of Australia now coming together in truth to create a future based on a foundation of justice. And in so doing, we are learning about our own history, freeing ourselves from the burden of denial, and coming into line with global standards of historical accountability that creates the preconditions for equality. The future of Australia is as a reconciled, independent, and proudly and truly multicultural nation that has dealt bravely and fully with its past, is free to express its own identity, and to represent an example for all nations of democracy, justice, and a balance between individual rights and collective responsibilities. The legal fraternity will, one way or another, play a central role as the gatekeepers to the law that is either accessible to all or which will continue to exclude some in Australia and some Australians. The Uluru Statement, Voice to Parliament and Australian Republic are fundamentally about respecting the basic rights of us all as we say so often in sport, a level playing field. That is the future of Australia. Thank you so much. So I've got the little glad bag. Um, Craig, thank you. That was phenomenal. Um, I think that here at Deakin, we're very, we seek to make a difference and you have shown us the ways that it can be done. Through sport, through using a platform that you have for having a passionate belief in what you do. It doesn't matter what tools we have. Um, it's a matter of getting out there and doing it and to make Australia a better place. So thank you for that. But it is Law Week, as the Chancellor said, so I'm just going to hop in and say one little thing about Law Week. It's about the rule of law. And uh, the rule of law, as Craig said, is a great leveller. And it's the concept that means that government and citizens are all equal before the law. And we accept it in principle. And Craig has shown us examples where we need to make it work in practice because we aren't seeing through those examples that Craig's given, the stories that, um, where people are not necessarily equal before the law. Um, and the law applies to governments and citizens and to the Bahraini government and to the Australian government. So it, it applies to all of us. At, the heart, at its heart, the rule of law is an aspiration that members of society must continuously work towards and Craig has shown us ways to do that. Deakin University is identified as part of its mission that it should be a catalyst for positive change for the individuals and communities it serves. And in that context, we've been delighted to host Craig this evening and to be able to share um, with you his thoughts on so many of the stories that touch us. Um, today, the students actually had a session with Craig at lunchtime and we had students um, from Deakin Create and I just want to acknowledge um, tonight that Dick and Create, the students who were there today, some of them are Afghani refugees. Um, one young lady is a Syrian refugee who said, nobody expects to be displaced. That's not what we're about. Nobody actually anticipates that they'll be a refugee. It's a geographical and political um, thing that's inflicted upon us. And I think that that's something that we really should think about very carefully in terms of our refugee communities. The Deacon Create Clinic um, is a home for many refugees who actually come our way, particularly via Karen Dunwoody and her team who actually work um, with, that, with that group. Um, 
universities are not able to provide Commonwealth supported places for many of the students who come through CREATE, so much of it's actually done through philanthropy. So should you be desirous, um, there are opportunities to donate. Um, we actively um, want to actually make a difference. Um, you will have seen on your chairs or been handed a brochure today um, that the Deakin Law Clinic students worked on in terms of the referendum and the voice to parliament. Um, the law clinics provide free legal services both in Geelong and in Melbourne um, for people who need support. Craig, thank you for tonight. I can't actually summarise what you've said because in fact it's so broad ranging, but, but you've covered sport. I love the way the Constitution got mentioned so many times. Um, Justice Michael Kirby tells me that he carries a copy of the Declaration of Human Rights in his pocket. So um, it's something that we all really need to focus on. Um, please, or thank you again to Craig. Thank you very much. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the proceedings for this evening. Thank you so much.